If Solenopsis and Victor has been dealt a blow in its conquest of America by the zombie flies, the situation is different elsewhere in the world. Helped along by man's carelessness, the fire ant has profited like never before from the explosion of world commerce. After invading parts of Asia, the fire ant is now a major challenge for Australia. The Australian government estimates that damage done by fire ants may cost the country $43 million. Ross Wiley is an entomologist for biosecurity, an organization specialized in the fight against the fire ant invasion since the ants were first discovered in Brisbane. The first fire ants we know came into Brisbane in 2001 and they came in as two separate introductions. There was one at the port of Brisbane and there was one in the western parts of Brisbane. Uh, there were uh, some ceramic pots that had been brought in from the United States and we thought that might have been the cause. And the genetics confirm this. The genetics tells us that we did in fact uh, get our fire ants from the southern United States, both from Texas and from Florida. In September 2001, the government of Queensland launched an eradication campaign. Teams of specialists sprayed the ground with insecticides adapted to fight against the Solenopsis Invicta. At first, the initiative seemed to be effective, but when nests outside the treated zones were discovered, disappointment reigned. The fire ants pursued their advance, applying two strategies that allowed them to persevere in the face of all obstacles. There are two forms of the ant. There are colonies that have single queens, and we call those monogynes, and there's colonies that have got multiple queens, many queens, and we call those polygyne. Now, monogynes don't like other fire ants or other ants. They tend to live separately, but they do have queens that are strong flyers, and they can fly up two kilometres usually, but perhaps up to five or ten kilometres. So their main dispersal is by flight. When a nest has too many mouths to feed, newly hatched queens have to leave and find new territory. The workers follow, and thus the fire ant never ceases to increase its territory. We have polygon colonies. These are the multiple queens, and they get on quite well with each other so that you can have many mounds in a small area and that's forming almost a super colony. Now they don't fly very far, their queens are weak flyers or don't, sometimes don't fly at all. So they tend to move only very short distances from the parent nest, so they spread slowly. But the danger is that because they have so many queens they can be easily transported by man uh, in soil movements, in pot plants, anything, they can be moved around readily. So in that sense, they're a little bit more dangerous for spread. A single colony with several queens is what Russ Wiley calls polygyne. A nest can have several dozen. The queen's only function is to lay eggs. There may be as many as 90,000 queens on one hectare of territory colonized by Solenopsis Invicta. Given that a queen lays 100 eggs per day, the population can grow by 9 million individuals daily. This dizzying power to multiply is a scientist's nightmare. So we use the genetics to determine whether we have a monogyne colony or a polygyne colony. If we have a polygyne colony, then we will then do tracing because we know that material must have moved there from somewhere and we get our inspectors to trace back and see if they can find out where that polygyne colony came from. If we find it, uh, then we can kill it uh, again. 
Okay. Can you flag that in? Yep. Once the trackers have found a hitherto unlisted colony, they fix its geographical coordinates with a GPS. The location is transmitted to a database that allows for a precise control of the zone. The trackers take a series of samples from the colony that are analyzed by the genetics lab in Brisbane. The analysis determines whether the colony is polygyne or monogyne. Because polygyne colonies reproduce faster, they are destroyed first. And now we're battling that third and final population, but the genetics can tell us whether there's anything else around any other populations that we haven't discovered. Hi guys. Hi Ross. Hi Evan. Hi Brad. Hey, did you end up getting that sample yet from? Uh, yes, Ross. From we've, Gary. Yes, we just yeah, run it. And now. you've done it already. It's all run. Oh wow. Um, as you can see, it's a polygon nest. Yeah. So it's very. Finally, genetics is showing us at the moment that I think we are winning the battle, or at least getting on top of the ant because the genetics says there's reduced genetic diversity of the ant, and this may result in reduced fitness of the ant to survive. It will not adapt as well as it could. The success in Australia is based on the systematic controls of Brisbane and the surrounding area. Unlike the rather cautious approach in the United States, Australian policy has been to take great measures, immediately investing hundreds of millions of dollars in the fight against the fire ant. Okay. See a thermal imaging camera attached to a helicopter is used to detect nests 150 meters away. For the first time in the history of this invasion, remote sensing is now used to search and then destroy the enemy hidden underground. The remote sensing is that we exploit um, the shape of a termite mound. A termite mound, by its particular shape, has got a thermal signature. In winter, it heats up, and sometimes it's about 20 degrees Celsius, more than the surrounding soil. The idea behind all of this is that if we can get ahead of the ant, if we know where the edge of the infestation is, then we can start to treat from the outside. We'll be ahead of it for the first time, and then we can start to move in and kill the ant. The advantage of that for the program is going to be that we're able to cover large areas of land from the air. Uh, we can cover 70, oh, 750 hectares a day with remote sensing, which is much more than we could ever do on the ground with teams of people. Perhaps surprisingly, in a country the size of Australia, remote sensing costs close to five times less than classic means of searching. Had a chance to have a look at it yet? Yeah, I started, I think, uh, fun one, but I'm um, pretty sure. Okay. The images recorded by the cameras are analyzed with an application that allows for an even more precise localization. So with this technology, we can do probably in a couple of hours what it would have taken us, a team, two or three days to achieve. But everything is all about speed, and this will certainly enable us to uh, do what we need to do to get ahead of the ant. What's the plan? This, is, this was completed yesterday, so we're now flying in this area. Now that nests can be localized, yeah. the race is on. Fire ants must be left no chance to form new colonies. Ross Wiley supervises the final preparations of this eradication plan. The goal is to confine the nests and to prevent any queens from surviving. Nice and easy. Vehicles carrying toxic products are sent to the terrain. Nice and easy. Okay, that'll do ya.
Okay, what we're going to do now is do a direct nest injection. What that involves is that we'll spear the nest around the outside to close off any foraging tunnels so the worker can't grab the queen and let her escape. Once we've done a nest assessment, we will then shower the whole area and flood the nest and then cover the nest back up and completely treat the nest with the chemical. Once that process has been done, we will then use all-terrain vehicles to go around and bait the area as a precaution, just to make sure that if the queen has escaped, the toxicants will then be effective and we will, we'll, we'll kill the nest completely. Eradicators spread granules, called pills, around each nest. Pills are coated with a substance the ants find to their liking. The workers immediately carry the granules into the nest and eat them. The queen, naturally, takes part in the feast. The active product in the pill slowly spreads through her body. In a few hours, the queen has been made sterile. Unable to reproduce, the colony is condemned to extinction. Is Solenopsis Invicta invincible in name only? Apart from now the genetics that we've talked about and the remote sensing, the other tool that we use very much and rely on is public awareness. And some of our figures show us that in Brisbane region, for instance, 97% of people in South East Queensland are aware of fire ants. About 50% of people say that they go out into their backyards and they look for ants and notify us if they find anything suspicious. And the other encouraging statistic is that in the last three years, 69% of all new findings of fire ants in South East Queensland have come from the public. Hello everybody, my name's Amanda and I'm from Biosecurity Queensland. How are we all today? Good. Good. Now I've brought a very special guest along with me today. The dog. A dog, absolutely. Good boy, Akka. Good boy. School children in Queensland are informed of the dangers of fire ants. Their knowledge will benefit the entire economy. We also provide training for various industries as to how they can do their own surveillance for fire ants. To do that, they need to be trained, and we would run something like 200 training courses in a year for members of the public and for people in business, and a lot of work put into what we call community engagement. The, we are battling the ant here, but there's always new incursions uh, occurring and could occur in different parts of Australia. Uh, we have very tight movement controls on movement of, say, nursery stock or anything that may carry fire ants. We do not allow this to move outside what we call the restricted area. At all ports of entry, cargo that could be carrying fire ants is put into quarantine. In Brisbane, dogs have been trained to detect the pheromones the ants emit from up to 40 metres away. The question of whether the fire ant is a pest or not, if you're talking seriously as a scientist or as a 
public official is a complicated question. Um, there's many, many different species that whose good fortunes depend strictly on humans. And sparrow, rats, mice. To me, it's, I don't think it's a pest. It's just another ant, another creature that is, uh, has found an opportunity that humans make for it, and it's exploiting that opportunity. That it's not warfare, it's ecology. Few countries are equipped to deal with such an invasion, and even fewer have the necessary budget. And yet recent studies show that half the Earth's surface could be colonized by fire ants. Solenopsis invicta is not even close to slowing its invasion. In ports all around the world, boats are waiting at the dock, ready for passengers to get on board. Thank you.